Okay, well, thanks very much for having me. Um, my apologies uh, that, uh, that this took a little bit to get together. Um, what I thought I would do, and, and this is uh, maybe particularly good since we've just got a small little group here. Um, I have something that I'm going to read. It's actually not particularly long, um, and it goes with a small set of photographs. And so I um, am one of the photo documentarians, I guess I would maybe put it that way, um, in, from the anti-fracking movement, and, and I live in Pennsylvania. And so I guess among the first things I should say is, I live on the shale. Um, I don't live where there's active fracking in my county, which is Columbia County, but I don't live more in really in any direction more than 30 or 40 minutes from um, active wells and pipeline and compressor stations. Right, so um, I'm going to actually talk some about fracking, um, but I'm also going to um, make an argument out because philosophers do that sort of thing. <laughs> That's my my uh, stuff. And I'm going to make an argument out that also connects um, climate change and some other things like um, feminism and racism to um, all these issues that revolve around extraction. Okay, So um, I'm just going to scroll through these pictures a little bit as I'm reading. This is the first one. Um, and this is, I wanted to start with something beautiful. Um, I actually took this picture just this last Sunday um, in Durham, England. Um, these are the botanical gardens at the University of Durham. Um, and so I just wanted us to start with something particularly beautiful because most of what you're going to see after this is not going to look, it's not going to be this pretty. <laughs> okay, so look at this for as long as you can because they just get the gear as we go on. <laughs> okay, all right. So in 1992, ways back, I was hired um, at a medium sized state school located in a very rural Pennsylvania town, uh, Bloomsburg, about three and a half hours uh, south, um, to teach, among other things, feminist philosophy. That's what I was hired for. Um, you can teach such courses from many different angles, but for me, someone who'd come to academia as a first-generation college student, um, a mother from a very young age, I have four kids, um, a welfare system survivor, <laughs> um, a factory laborer, um, and, but also having grown up in the mountains of Colorado before the shale boom scarred its front range. It's actually really hard for me to even go back there now. The relationship between theory right, or philosophy and action has always just been a really potent one, an important one. Um, critical too is that the, this relationship between theory and action needs for me to be anchored in facts. I teach, for example, philosophy of science. It okay, needs to be anchored in facts. Um, and I will return to the important of importance of facts here in just a few minutes. Um, but I wanted to say this. Facts are the most important and riskiest things on the planet. Uh, they're also the things, I think, that have been just summarily ignored during this election cycle, um, especially with respect to environmental issues. Okay. Um, Philosophy has always, for me, been about fulfilling um, Karl Marx's demand that ideas aren't just about knowing the world, but ideas have to be about changing it. Because philosophy is about everything. It's about in what a just or compassionate or good or beautiful world might consist. But as also, philosophy's also earned and rightfully earned some real reproach in many quarters because of philosophers' reluctance to engage. Um, the, we have the snotty, we're the thinkers, you are the doers kind of attitude, right? or at least it's common in philosophy. <laughs> um, but this view, I want to argue, isn't merely wrong. It's one that no one can afford in any discipline, in any job, anywhere, anymore. Whatever our professions or arts or practices or jobs, we are just out of excuses at this point. That is unless we're prepared to accede to an ecological apocalypse that's coming for our children if we fail. Oh. Okay, I can just now go to the next picture. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, next, okay, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, no, no, up, up a little bit. No, right there, right there in the middle. 
And, it, and usually I can get these to come up picture by picture by picture, but we're just gonna deal with what we got. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. So here's the second picture following that first really lovely one. Okay, so um, this is a very typical uh, example of a frack pad. Okay, this is about 40, 45 minutes, give or take, for me. I can't get to this side anymore because I can't actually get through the police presence now. Uh, it, they, they've become much more. There was a time what, uh, early on when I was taking these pictures um, from about 2010 on, and there are thousands of these on my face, on my uh, Flickr page, where I could actually walk right onto these sites because they weren't guarded by police. Right? That time has long passed, um, and unless I'm willing to risk um, arrest for criminal trespass, right? and I've actually already been in trouble for that even when I have a committed criminal trespass, um, I can't even get to the site. That used to be a mountain though, and that's what you want to see. That was a mountain. And that's acres and acres and acres of sparred land that are, will never ever be the same. Right? Plus they're actively extracting natural gas. Right? So all the roads going in and out of this right, are always covered with trucks and tankers and sand cans. Right? It's pretty quiet right now just because the price of gas is so low. Right? That's all going to change um, once the pipelines come in. Right, once that pipeline infrastructure is ready, then you know this will this is all going to blow up again. Okay, so that's our next picture. Um, so what philosophy has meant for me as a practical matter was that doing feminist philosophy could never be an armchair exercise. Right? Instead, I take pictures, um, and that its dimensions must reach beyond what concepts like liberation or equality mean for those already privileged by race or geography, or access to education or ability or as climate change makes increasingly scarce right, access to things, to basic existential necessities like arable land, breathable air, clean water, right, all of which this screws over. Hence, much of my career has been about trying to theorize the oppression, for example, of sexual minorities, developing world and indigenous peoples, non-human animals, endangered biota, and their rapidly eroding ecosystems. Um, but my career's also been about what Marx called, this may be a name familiar to you, called praxis. That is the creative labor which risks bringing ideas into reality. And I would argue that there are three institutions that are responsible for virtually all forms of oppression, right, including the oppression that involves things like class and region and geography, which is what you see here. Right? Um, they form what I call in my written work um, the axes of human chauvinism, what a lot of folks in environmentalism call anthropocentrism, um, but I actually call it human chauvinism because I think it's stronger. Um, the view that membership in homo sapiens, or some segment of homo sapiens, right, some part, entitles a very lucky few to treat all of their living things, their cultures, their habitats, as commodities or consumables or disposables. I would argue that these three institutions are heteropatriarchy, racism, and speciesism. However disconnected NSA and say outsourcing surrogate motherhood to India, I write about that, seems in, compar in comparison to say uh, analyses of animal agriculture like factory farms um, in North Carolina, connected to terrorism in Paris, the effects of climate change for Mexican fishermen, or Syrian refugeeism in Greece, right, and on and on and on. These things, I want to argue, are all connected through these three basic institutions of patriarchy or racism or speciesism. Right? And it's, but it is ultimately, I want to argue, um, the circulatory system of capitalism. I'm an unrepentant Marxist on this point, um, of capitalism that makes all of those other institutions so maximally exploitable. Thank you. Uh, it is its circulatory regime um, that all value is market value, that all things have a price, that all resources, and especially denial, right, which is one of our greatest resources on the planet, must be counted as endless. Right? The capitalist requires resources to simply be inexhaustibly endless, like hydrocarbons and water. Um, we're all thus implicated in what's been cynically termed the Anthropocene, right? or as Jason Moore, who's this really great philosopher of Binghamton, calls the capitalism, um, but I actually call it um, ecological nihilism. Okay, so here's a story I want to tell you about facts. 
Okay, oh, and we can now, let me, okay, we can scroll down to the next picture. Okay, um, these are beautiful little girls um, that I took at um, the Women's College in Kolkata, India, um, last January. And these little girls were really excited um, because they, they're they at the college, but they're outside, and women's colleges in this part of India are still relatively rare. Um, and they live in circumstances that are incredibly difficult in a country that's really exploding with respect to growth, right? Growth that we in the West like to call development. But for many people, including these little girls, probably results in contaminated water and increasing hardship. Okay, so, um, all right, and we can scroll down one more picture. <laughs> okay, all right, here. Here's the yellow. Right. Here's one of my examples um, for us right now of speciesism. This is the Portland Zoo in Oregon. This, my family lives in Corvallis. Um, this is the elephant enclosure uh, that I, I'm no fan of zoos. Uh, and this is, this is the elephant enclosure. Um, and these are elephants who are actually trying to play. Um, but it's incredibly difficult. Um, and I, this is one of my examples of, of speciesism that I think is ultimately connected to those little girls that's ultimately connected to that practice. All right, so what I'd like to do is tell a story about the importance of facts. This is a kind of personal story, um, but my hope is that, you'll, is that uh, you'll see how it may intersect with a number of the issues that are relevant to both Green Party politics and also, indeed, the future of a livable planet. Um, I should warn you, however, that some really popular concepts in my story are not going to come out well. Right, so I'm preparing to offend you at this point. Um, some of the concepts that are not going to come out all that well here. Our, words, our concepts are words like activism, sustainability, which I think is entirely co-opted at this point. The word progressive isn't going to come out all that well. Liberal is not going to come out all that well. And feminist is not going to come out all that well. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so here we go. The story begins with me and my camera um, uh, and that monstrous pathology of capital uh, capitalism called hydraulic fracturing, um, or fracking. I had this idea that if I could just show folks, show people, just what this infrastructure looked like, the pads, the wells, the trucks, the tankers, the roads, the parking lots, the dust, the denuded hillsides, the flattened mountaintops, the dead wildlife, the nasty carcinogenic spills, the anger, the polluted waterways, the divided communities, the ruptures, the noise, the oily sheen on your water, the particulate matter, the cancers, and the asthma. <laughs> all right, they're ready to show you. All right, that was my whole goal in starting taking all these pictures. That uh, if I could get folks to just see with their own eyes the damn damage, right, backed up by comprehensive, thoroughly documented descriptions of the dangers, right, from my research, that this would generate righteous outrage. Right? And that the righteous outrage would be so great that it would help galvanize a loud, resolute movement of civil rights style, nonviolent insurgency, compelling governments, township by township, county by county, state by state, to outlaw what was so obviously a blight on the very conditions of life. Right? So, next picture. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, this is from the climate part. Uh, in New York City. Okay, various estimates of the attendance between 200 and 400,000. It was very crowded. It was really cool to be there. Uh, and um, this is one of, one of the folks and one of the signs that I thought um, actually illustrated this point about the capitalist scene quite neatly. Okay, um, all right. So I set out, yeah, with my cameras. I climbed hills. I run roads. I irritated the bejeebers out of cranky security guards. Mm -hmm. And I shot about 4,000 pictures of Gasholia, which is what we call it affectionately in Pennsylvania, Gasholia. I uploaded them to Facebook. I uploaded them to Flickr. I took these pictures on the road. I made good posters out of them. I took them to talks. I, I blew them up, right, as in made the bigger. <laughs> um, I went to hearings. I took shots of anxious elected people in order to shame them, and, and you know, for voting for more gas rates, right, in order to shame them. I weathered a joint FBI uh, state police eco-terrorism investigation 
that brought an officer named Michael Hudson to my house on Valentine's Day of 2014. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, to my house. My, this is my house like out in rural Pennsylvania, right, where I just own a, an old farmhouse on a little street and all my neighbors right, are looking at this big black van that's parked in front of my house with all the windows tinted out. So I had ended up having to have the guy come in so my neighbors would not be gawking. Okay, so there he is, and he's like, well, can we look around? No, I don't think so. <laughs> and he's there, I totally kid you not, to ask me about pipe ops. Like what I knew about pipe ops, which I, I really want to make sure we're clear. I don't know jack about, about pipe ops. <laughs> Uh, I told him at the time, I said, you know, look, I could, you know, bake a pipe bomb or I could bake a cake. The pipe bomb would be more edible and it would taste better. <laughs> That's what I know about pipe bombs. Right? But he was there. He was there for about 45 minutes um, scaring me, essentially. Right? This is how dissent is silenced. Right? It's not because they had anything. This is just how dissent is silenced because protest in the United States, right? Even we talk a good game about the democracy and the protest, right? But we don't, you're not actually, you're not supposed to use those rights. You're supposed to think that you have them, but you're not supposed to actually take them on the road and try them out. Okay, so that's what he was there for. Okay, um, oh, next, next picture. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, yeah, just back up a little bit. Okay, so here in Pennsylvania, you can compressor station, you can frackety frack frack on state game lands, state forest lands. This is Tyodonton State Forest. It is beautiful. It's, a, it's just outside of Williamsport, Pennsylvania. It is that. It well, it was really beautiful. And one of the United States' most contiguous, uninterrupted chunks of forest until the gas came, it is also home to the endangered eastern flying squirrel. Right? So, um, those, that's pipeline, of course, right? There's a compressor station back behind those trees. And you can see just the dust rising from the road, right? That's, that's, uh, that's our state game land 75. Okay, um, so, all right, let's see. At least in Pennsylvania, here, here's what happened. I took all these pictures. I thought that this would be a contribution to the revolution. Right, that, I, that was my one little piece, right? That was my, my, my job, my thing that I could do. Right? I was taking these pictures and I was writing about them. I write this really incendiary blog called The Wrench. Right? And I'm just writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. Right? Right? So I, I wait thinking, people are going to go. Right? They're going to get mad. Right? The, the, the movement is coming. And then it never happened. Now I'm cut the insurgency just didn't materialize. To be very clear, this is not to say that there aren't very real heroes in Pennsylvania, right? And lots of places. Of course there are. Next picture. We'll talk about this one in just a second. It's not to say that I thought the photographs could have that, you know, singular an effect all by themselves. Right? It's not that I thought I was fomenting a revolution on my own. It's not to say that there haven't been loads of people who have taken some real risks. Right? There are absolutely have. And to be fair, the odds are stacked against states like Pennsylvania, where the laws that govern municipalities make fomenting insurrection particularly difficult. Because municipalities in PA are they're called second class. They're called, called second class, which is really all you need to know which means that the state can always preempt any laws that the municipalities try to erect to govern their own citizens, right? There's always state preemption. Okay, um, so yeah, the, fair, the odds are stacked against uh, states like Pennsylvania where the laws that govern municipalities, right, make fomenting insurrection hard. This is, however, to say that after, at that point, five years of waiting, five years where it got harder and harder and harder to get good shots, I'll talk about that one, without risking criminal trespass. I felt, ultimately, I felt compelled to step back and evaluate more carefully the question why we were not only no closer to a ban in Pennsylvania, but no near even to regulations that would keep drill rigs off school grounds, right? Or off, 
you know, the grounds where your mom and dad are retired and trying to play bingo. Right? Or at the grounds of my, of my university. Right? Um, I, we got nothing. Um, so, this is what leads me to this particular photograph. So, this probably isn't as obvious as some of the others, but this is a drilling mud spill. Okay, this is on route. This happened on Route 220, um, way way out, uh, very very rural, very mountainous, Sull Sullivan County, Pennsylvania, about an hour from where I live. I got a call one morning, like at about 5:30 in the morning. If you get out there before the police tape, you could get onto those grounds, right? Because there's no police tape yet. Tape. Right, so there is a you know, little tiny Honda and all the cameras, and, brrr, and I drive out there, and it's like, this just can't even do it justice, right? This, this pipe had ruptured, and it had dumped all this drilling mud everywhere, right? So I'm actually climbing out. You can see the pipeline, right? Can you see where the pipeline is, mm -hmm. right? So it's ruptured, like, just about up this way, and I am, like, climbing out onto that chunk of pipeline, right? <laughs> trying to shoot so you can see the sheen on the water, right? So you can actually see how nasty that is. And that little, that gray nasty color, that's like God knows what, right? It's, it's, it's called produced water. Um, it's, it's drilling fluids, right? So it's benzene, toluene, diesel, you know, boom. <laughs> so I'm out there and I fell in it. I fell in it. Right, so, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Gotta get that off, right? Get a bird, get a bird. Right, so I climb down where I know there's a creek, Little Muncie Creek, and Little Muncie Creek. And I see it's coming right into the creek. Right into the creek. Right, so I get down there and I wash off a little bit. And I, you know, repossess myself. <laughs> yeah, and my camera's okay, which is what really matters. <laughs> And I climb back out onto the site, and I see there's um, a fresh water tanker truck on the site. But the lid's off, the, the top's off, right? And that's odd, because it's a fresh water tanker, and you don't want the water to get dirty, right? So, the, you know, the lid should be, it should be capped. And so I'm like, hmm, hmm, and I climbed up on it, because right? no police tape yet, no police were there yet, it's still really early in the morning. So I climbed up, oops, I climbed up on top of the tanker, and I looked down, and I shot down, right, these, you can find these on my flicker page, um, into the fresh water tanker, and it was all drilling fluids. And the smell was, it's, it's acrid, it's acidic, very acrid smelling. And that, so they were using fresh water tankers for produced water, for drilling fluids. Right, so, like, I dispatch all these pictures right, to the police, right, to the Department of Environmental Protection. Right? You gotta see these. Right? Here's the revolution. Right? This will all stop. Look at what the. Look. <laughs> and then nothing happens. That school was nasty. And within a matter of hours, I, you couldn't have gotten on that site at all because right, those police tests. Okay. So, all right, next picture. We can go to the next one now. Oh yeah, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Okay, yeah, here's the police. Okay, yep. Yeah. All right, yeah, no, you can just stay right there. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. This is at the inauguration of Governor Wolf. Yeah, yeah, where I was I was taking the pictures of my friends being arrested, including the one in the corner that you'll see in a minute, who's a hero of mine, Maggie Henry. Okay, so next section here. I've thought about all this a lot. Uh, obsessively, why this revolution hasn't happened? Why do you have a, a ban at least on fracking? Although you have, you've got everything else to be honest with you, and like your and your ban is not going to hold. And I'm really sorry to tell you that, but you're going to lose it. <laughs> uh, I've thought a lot about this. Why why don't we care more about our health, and why don't we care more about our kids' health, and why don't we care? Why don't we care about? It? And so here's just a sample. The next number of things of what I've come up with, and what it's vitally important for me to tell you is that each item on the list I'm about to describe I think is connected by a single conceptual cable. 
our short night, our short sightedness, and right, it's encouraged in us by a capitalist culture and a kind of moral myopia um, with respect to relationships between those axes of human chauvinism, the relationships between things like racism and patriarchy and class and speciesism, all of which are exploited by capital, all of which get us this police state right here. And so first, um, this is what we're missing in our movements, in these next things. First, it has to do, and for me this is one of the most important and also makes me deeply unpopular, um, the unequal treatment of uh, non-human animal suffering. And part of what makes all of this so possible is that we don't care about the lives that live in these places. We just don't care. We don't care if they're endangered. We don't care if they're not. We just don't care. Right? And so we destroy them, and they never come back, right? but we don't care. Um, we will never gain, I would argue, any real and enduring traction against the hydrocarbon extraction industries, right, or any of the other, like the sugar industry, for example, until we see that the fight against fracking is the fight to end animal agriculture, right? That they're the same fight, that they have to be the same fight. While there's much dispute about which is the greatest greenhouse gas emitter, the facts are stunningly clear on this point. And here's where facts really matter. We could drive our stretch hummers until the cows, quite literally, came home. And it won't make one whit of difference curbing CO2 or methane emissions until we shutter the factory farms. We end the um, industrialized dairies and we put an end to animal agriculture. Even if we don't care about the suffering, right, which we should, we ought to, but even if we don't care about that, right, we're not gonna gain any traction. Right? There's no point in being a member of an anti-fracking movement if you're gonna go out afterwards and get a pile of bacon at Denny's. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right, moreover, I'd argue we're hypocrites. Every time we hold up a sign on the steps of a Capitol building decrying the damage to human health of the gas industry, only to retire to bacon burgers at a local eatery. And if we protest that the meat's like free range or organic, still hypocrites, since even putting, even if we put the animal suffering aside, there's no way the planet can sustain free range and feed more than the tiny number of affluent, mostly white Westerners who can afford it. Most, most importantly, however, for me, is that if we're serious about being a credible movement that claims to care about suffering, we need to act like we care about suffering. And that means working just as hard to end animal culture as fracking or mountaintop removal or tar sands extraction. Because they're all really the same. And we can go down a couple. And so, there's um, the police officers at uh, Tom Wolf's inauguration. Tom Wolf, a Democrat, right, who uh, we appeal to in Pennsylvania over and over and over again to ban fracking. I've been deeply critical of, of, of Governor Wolf and even more critical of the anti fracking organizations who continue to donate money to him. Uh, I think they, uh, they should be ashamed of themselves, actually. Um, and you're not going to find me saying anything nice about the Sierra Club, the Environmental Defense Fund, or the World Wildlife Federation for the same reasons. Hey, this person over here is Maggie Henry. Maggie Henry, um, she had never been arrested in her life. She's in her mid-60s. She actually owns a dairy farm. Um, and she was at this inauguration crying because she knew she was going to be arrested because she wasn't going to stand down. She wasn't going to stop calling out Wolf's name when she was instructed to do so by that delightful state police officer. Right, so she was arrested and she's standing there crying and I'm just back far enough just to get the shot off without getting snagged by the handcuffs. Because right, it's hard to take pictures when you're cuffed. <laughs> okay, all right, right next to it. Um, that's also, this is also Ty Dotton State Forest and that's pipeline coming right out of the forest right on a trail, the Pesto Trail to Love Run, which is a naturalized area with a pipeline running through it. And we still call that naturalized. <laughs> yeah. 
So there you go. That's hiking, hiking trail right there. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. All right, second. Uh, what part of what we're missing in our movements is that the appeal to sustainability, I'd argue. We appeal to, us, we appeal to the concept of sustainability as if a planet roasted by climate change weren't still sustainable. Right? We can roast the planet, and it's still sustainable. It's not for us. Right? It, it'll just suck. Right? We can make it into a, a scene from Mad Max, from Thunder Road. Right? We can make it into The Walking Dead. It's still sustainable. Right? Which is why sustainable is just not enough. Right? I, don't know, I don't know why the hell we settle for that. Okay, we use this magic word as if we believe sustainable is necessarily accompanied by, say, rich biotic diversity. Mm -mm. Restored wilderness or social justice. But this is false. This is simply false. We can perfectly well wreck the joint for all kinds of other critters and still survive, at least for a while. Right? So, I mean, that's what we're doing right now. Right? We're wrecking it for everything else. Right? We're just hoping that we'll still be around in the end. Some will. Right? We, we're still fossil fueling and animal carcass eating our way to ecocide, an ecocidal wasteland. Right? And it will, to be sure, catch up with us eventually. Um, and it will do immeasurable harm to many others, human and non-human, along the way. But our greatest ability and ultimately our most self-defeating capacity, both, is one and the same, and it's our capacity to adapt. It's one of our greatest abilities as human beings, right? But it's also our greatest weakness. We will adapt, right? We are, we're adapting right now. It's hot, right? Um, we'll call that sustainable, right? But the only thing we've sustained is an economic system in whose circulation of carbons and animal bodies and water and sugar and human labor and the racist and sexist premises that ensure that it all stays really cheap Right, lay immense profits for a very, very few and increasing misery or extinction for everything else. Right, if the future of the planet isn't to be more than merely sustainable, right, if it's going to be actually desirable, something we want to leave our kids, then, you know, if, if, that, if we don't care more than that, what's the point of getting cranky over what we do doing now? And right, if we don't want more than that. Okay, so third, oh, we can skip down one. Oh, yeah. There's a lovely photograph of a, a very um, thin cow um, trying to live sustainably in an increasingly ecologically um, deteriorated part of um, northern India, um, relatively near the border of Bhutan, but an area that has become more and more and more polluted with respect to its water resources, right? And hence it's non-human animal life, including non-human animal life that people depend on. Um, is becoming more and more and more um, uh, unable to, to eat, unable to be sustained. Okay, so next. I think that we need to abandon the idea that progressive, the word progressive, and the word capitalist can make progress. No. So-called progressives, right, the ostensibly anti-racist, anti-sexist wing, wing of the Democratic Party, right, who, demand, who do good things, Right? Who demand a rise in the minimum wage, a commitment to the COP21 agreements, who oppose TPP, who are, what? Yeah, you don't even want to get me on that. <laughs> who stand up with Black Lives Matter and speak out for women's reproductive rights, all awesome, right? All good things. They're doomed to keep losing to both the Trumpster, the Trumpster fascists, and the liberals in their own party, so long as we continue to believe that capitalism can be salvaged and humanized through regulation. It cannot. And here's why. Right? Here's why. Three necessary presuppositions that govern every capitalist enterprise, even the little ones, you're right, right up you know, to Wally World, right up to Walmart. Three presuppositions. One, that its resources are endless. Every capitalist enterprise depends on this fundamental idea that it won't run out of the basic materials it needs to make its stuff, right? to make its service, to make its whatever. And the, the most fundamental of these resources are carbons, water, sugar, and labor. Okay. Second, all capitalist enterprises must grow or die. It's the credo. Right? Necessitating the belief that its resources are endless. Right? There's no other way to grow right? unless you can assume that your resources are endless, which is why one of their most important resources is denial. Because right? we all know that the hydrocarbons are going to run out. 
right? It's a matter of time, right? We keep developing better and better technology, right, to get deeper and deeper under the ground, to get more and more out, right? But it's going to eventually run out. And before it runs out, we may contaminate so much of our water, right, or so much of it may be privatized so that we don't have access to it unless you have money, right, that the likelihood that this, that the anxiety and anger will produce more and more violence and more and more acts of terrorism is increasingly high. Right? And those two things are intimately connected. All you have to do is ask a Syrian farmer, right, who's now in a city that's absolutely blown to shit, why they left the countryside. Right? And they're going to say, they're going to tell you in one word, well, two words, drought. And the corruption in trying to get a well done, to get to water that used to be seven feet, and now is 60 feet, and now is 130 feet. Okay? So, um, third presupposition of capitalism, that uh, it rewards hard work, right? that's uh, mythical, regardless factors like sex, class, or ethnicity. Quite false. Right? Thus excusing its penchant for producing sweatshops and abusive labor practices that take advantage of sex, class, and race in order to assure the widest possible ratio right, of investment to profit. Okay, so long as progress, right, in quotation marks, continues to be tethered exclusively to economic measures, you can go down one now, um, uh, to economic measures, progressive can be no more than a variety of liberal. Neoliberal, it's neoliberalism with a kinder, gentler face. It's George Bush. And moreover, a finite planet cannot sustain the myth of endless resources without devastating consequences. Climate change is the barometer of human arrogance. It's the barometer of human hubris. And until we see that the anthropogenic causes of our planetary ruin, progressive will remain as doomed to reproduce heterosexism, racism, and speciesism as its enemies among the Trumpsters, with only one difference. We, the progressives, stand outside the walls of Rome or Cleveland <laughs> while the city burns offering bottled water to the survivors while the climate change deniers, the religious, like Pence, mm -hmm. right, the religious ideologues, and the CEOs of Chevron sip their wine right, in cement bunkers. But the city still burns. Still burns. Okay, uh, uh, okay. And, and people end up living um, like this. So where that cow is, this is just a town. Um, this is northern India, Mayaguri, India, little tiny town and people living just under conditions that are, are just immensely difficult. And um, I recommend to any of you, if you've never um, been to that part of the world, um, you learn about yourself in India. Um, you learn what you can tolerate and you learn a lot about what people and their animals tolerate because there's no clean water here and this is the Darjeeling region this is where all your tea is coming from and there's no clean water and the most recent um, evidence suggests that the Darjeeling region is going to in the next 20 or 30 years no longer be able to produce tea at least at the rate that it does currently right which is immense these the Darjeeling tea fields are enormous they go on for miles, but it's too hot. It's too hot, and there's too much drought. It's too dry. They can't irrigate, and the water's polluted. Okay. All right. So, fourth, and this, there's just five on this list. Um, fourth, I think that we need to rectify our failure to pursue climate change, species extinction, labor abuses, terrorism, things that may not seem intimately connected to these, homophobia, misogyny, and so on at the level that specifically recognizes their global connections, right? Which is part of the reason I'm showing you some pictures from just some other places, their global connections. Um, and the demand for global level cooperation and sacrifice, right? Which we're not very good at in the West, right? The whole sacrifice, we love the cooperation part. That's an easy sound bite. We're not much about the sacrifice part, right? Because we're the great consumers. Um, among, uh, among the things that left me the most demoralized and disenchanted with the Pennsylvania anti-fracking movement was the basic nimbyism, the not-in-my-backyardism 
of its typical strategizing to resist the gas industry. And again, I say this knowing there are many exceptions, but this is sort of the tenor of that movement. The, def the defense of property rights is fundamentally incompatible with the defense of planetary ecological integrity. Right? You can't do both at the same time. The reasons why, right, this got me to be very unpopular around the, the Holler and Sugar Bush uh, debacle over the Constitution pipeline, because they were defending property rights, but not the ecological integrity of their trees, and so the trees got mowed down. Okay, um, property, let's see, the reasons why, is because property is always going to devolve into mine, and ecological integrity doesn't divide along the fictional lines of mine or yours. It doesn't have those sorts of borders. Ecology is not merely territory. The value of property is always rendered as a price. Right? It's bought, it's sold. Right? The value of ecological integrity is incalculable. Right? Is incalculable and a necessary existential condition. The fundamental contradiction, moreover, is built into the premises of one of the most well-meaning and popular organizations, I think it's popular in New York, it's very popular in Pennsylvania, the Community Environmental Defense Fund, about whom I've been very critical. I have real interactions with them and they're not cheerful. <laughs> um, insofar as it takes the community, right, CELDEF takes the community to be a kind of collective property it has no viable way of adjudicating conflicts between, say, a township that votes to invite in Crestwood or Williams Pipeline and a township that resists corporate incursion. Right? No way to adjudicate a, conference, a, a conflict between a community that determines membership based on sex or race. Right? Say a community that decides it's comfortable with slavery right? or sex trafficking and one that decries such criteria as bigotry. A world divided into properties is just as readily the game throws as it is a mosaic of democratic decision making. And the concept of community rights is as easily conscripted to the right to produce township revenue via sex trafficking, puppy mills, factory farms, or uranium mining as it is through organic farming or decentralized solar power. Right? So I'm saying there's nothing special about the notion of the community or community rights that guarantees that its members are going to do anything like the right thing. Right? There's nothing that guarantees that, and Soldef, Soldef doesn't address it. We can go down one more if you would like. And so this is back to the gigantic climate change march. Did it with, was anybody here, there, at the, the big march in New York City? It was September a couple of years ago? Yeah, it was, that was just a pretty interesting thing to be at. Right? So there's, there's some of the folks. Okay, uh, let's see. Last one. Okay, here's the last one. Um, I think that we need to address far more thoroughly the endemic heterosexism and racism in the environmental movement in the United States. You don't like to talk about it, right, but it's endemic. Insofar as the American environmental movement has remained the polite province of overwhelmingly white and affluent organizations like the Sierra Club, the Environmental Defense Fund, the World Wildlife Federation, and insofar as a lot of its smaller groups down the food chain modeled their own activism after the Big Brothers, right? You, 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 we were talking about this over dinner. You think you, you sign a petition, and you think, oh, I've done some of it. I feel good. <laughs> I'm going to now go watch Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> right? You know, or you stand with a sign, you know, on the steps of Harrisburg. And you know, God knows, I spent a lot of time in the steps of Harrisburg holding up signs. Right? And, you know, in your comfortable shoes and your khakis. <laughs> Okay. And you think, and then it's like, well, we're done. Okay, you know what's next, right? And it doesn't. And then we go home, and the and the and the gas companies are thrilled with this because we've exhausted our energy. You know, we feel like we've done the right thing. They can just continue on, and then nothing happens. Right? Nothing happens. Okay. Um, yeah, we reproduce both the internal and our, even in our smaller our smaller environmental organizations or grassroots groups. We produce both the internal hegemony, hegemony of mostly white male leadership and priorities and the external geopolitics of privileging the issues that affect their donor constituencies. Right? We still just do their stuff. Right? And I'm heartily sick of that. 
So we can see the value of revitalizing carbon sinks, right? Here's an example, right? We see the value, right? This is the environmental defense uh, fund of revitalizing carbon sinks so through, say, reforesting projects in the developing world, but we ignore entirely the cost to the farming villages that we displace when we replant the forest, right? And we push them off their land, right? Because we don't care, right? We create techno-utopian coalitions like the Breakthrough Energy Coalition that came out of um, the Paris Climate Conference, COP21, right? The Breakthrough Energy sounds great, right? This is the, you know, we're gonna fix it all with technology, right? But we sidestep any discussion about the egregious human rights violations of its member <coughs> corporations. You can go down one. We endorse E.O. Wilson, right? He's a really good scientist. Yeah, yeah, oh, I love this one. Yeah, act like you live here, yeah. Climate Warren. Hey, we endorse E.O. Wilson's really interesting book, it's called Half Earth, right, where he says we should be setting aside something like half the Earth through, uh, for um, ecological restoration, right? But we don't accompany, right, we endorse that, but we don't accompany our thinking about that or our signing on to that with any real discussion about which ecosystems we're going to reclaim, who lives in them, right, or what reclamation actually means. Right? And we ignore almost entirely the fact that women are disproportionately and negatively impacted by all of these things, especially poor women and or developing world women. Okay, so here's the last part, here's the upshot. The theme that governs a lot of my philosophical work and my insurgency is that there is, there is no social justice without environmental stability. But there also is no environmental stability worth the monumental effort um, worth the effort if it's to remain unaccompanied by social justice on a global scale. We can no longer afford the convenient denial of just not knowing where our shoes, our clothes, our cars, our bottled water, our solar panels, our, our wind turbines, our everything comes from. We cannot afford that ignorance. And this is, of course, neither an original thought or a new argument. I'm sure we all know this. But it, this argument is lent, I think, some new urgency as we exceed 450 parts per billion. Because willful ignorance isn't gonna keep the oceans from rising. It's not gonna keep the deserts from scorching. It's not gonna keep the disease vectors like Ebola or Zika from widening. Right? It's not gonna keep the desperation of human populations from erupting into violence. I know we place a very high premium on nonviolence. But so long as we continue to mistakenly confuse that with just capitulation, right? The police were on the steps, you know, the Capitol building at Harrisburg, right? The police come and they say, you must go now. And we're like, all right. <laughs> and we just go, right? We don't stand our ground. We don't even sit down and, and lock arms, right? We, do, we just, uh, uh. so long as we continue, right, to do this, right? To capitulate to the authorities to tell, to tell us to stand down. So long as we stand down, we're gonna lose. Right, perhaps at some point, when there's nothing left to lose, right, the bullets fired in our direction, right, and it could certainly come to that, there's billions of dollars at stake here, right, so this is not, you know, not a game. Right, uh, the bullets fired in our direction to protect the billions flowing into their pockets might seem worth the risk. Right, but by then it's possibly just too late. We better hope that it's not too late, because on the other side, on the other side of this, on the other side of our sterile belief that signing petitions or just holding signs or settling for sustain the sustainable or worrying more about politeness than justice, right, which we do a lot of, or ignoring the intimate and very bloody connections between ecology and justice, right? As so long as we don't do this, there's not going to be any green and there won't be much of a party. Yeah, here's the climate march. There's not very many, a few, but not 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 a great deal of ethnic diversity. All right, possibly as many as 300,000 people at this march, but mm, not not a lot, not a lot of ethnic diversity. Um, you know, which is just distressing. Um, we, we can go down one more if you'd like. This is the last photograph that I included. I don't know um, who all might know who this is. Um, this is um, Hillary Acton. She is just one of your greatest activists in New York State. Uh, she died 
a little over a year ago. She's my friend, and she was just absolutely fierce, one of the fierce activists at, at the siege at Lake Seneca. Um, so, yeah, I think it's sort of everything is in her, in, in her poster. She was fearless. So, I know it's hot, um, and you may be just feeling kind of bleary, and I've been yelling at you. <laughs> Um, but any any questions? Anything you'd like to say? Yeah. Kind of a comment or question. Um, when you first started, you said you were going to cover something you called the circulatory of the system of the capitalist right, which system. Right. I sort of hand wave at, but don't talk about oh, okay. yeah, uh, a lot. When you said that, I, I was yeah, thinking, yeah, yeah. okay, the money system. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, and I I mean a system of a system of exchange where the value of really anything potentially is um, reduced to exchange, right? is cashed out as exchange. Um, and so then everything is either is a potential commodity, or if not a commodity, a consumable, right, and or a consumable or a disposable. Um, and in a world where everything is a potential commodity, nothing has value that's worth actually saving for its own sake. And I would argue this is very much the world that we, in fact, inhabit, and that it is what is responsible, uh, that we have um, jettisoned, we've forfeited other kind of moral value, aesthetic value, civic value, insofar as we've jettisoned those other forms of value uh, until we work really aggressively to recover them, then it seems to me we're not, we're not going to stem this tide. And, and you know we're approaching 500 parts per billion by mid-century, and then then it's too late. Then it's really too late. Um, I, I was asking in particular about that because one thing I observed or read about, which I found just absolutely amazing, is since about 2011 or 12, most of these vacuum companies yeah. have actually been cash flow negative. That is correct. And so even within their own internal logic, yeah. they should be going down. But the banks are basically lending them more money. That's the circulatory system keeping them alive. Which, of course, could conceivably lead to another bank crisis. So I mean, here's their rationale, right? Here's their argument. We just need to have the pipelines, right? If we yeah. just have the pipelines, right? And so there's this immense surge of pipeline construction in Pennsylvania. And there's actually quite a bit in New York, too, right? There's a big fight over the Constitution, just for example. Um, so the argument, if we have the pipelines, right, so we can transport the gas, right, we can get it to export depots, you know, Chenier, Chenier Louisiana, Cove Point, Maryland, or, you know, we can make gas plants, right, gas, gas, pow gas power plants, right, we'll retire those nasty coal plants because we have clean, burning natural gas, right, which of course is not clean, it is burning, but it's not clean. Right. Methane is an even more powerful greenhouse gas over the long haul than CO2. Right. So, for example, in my region of Pennsylvania, we've got this immense build out of pipeline and natural gas power depots that we name things. So the pipeline in, uh, that's going to come in about three miles from my little farmhouse is called the Atlantic Sunrise. Mm -hmm. right. We're talking about this over dinner. We name them, right? These, these beautiful things, right? Like, you know, sparkly twinkle butterfly. <laughs> right, and we have these power plants. We've got three of them in my county. These, and these things are huge, these power plants. And they're all, uh, the company is Moxie. We call them Freedom and Patriot and um, Liberty. Freedom and Freedom, right? Liberty and Freedom <laughs> and, and Patriot. And, and that plays really well out where I live. Where I live is real conservative country, and every other house has got, you know, their Trump sign out now. Right? I, it's God and guns country out where I live. And so, you know, you name a power plant freedom, and, and you know, you're, you're good. <laughs> you're good. That's like, it's like, it's all the things. Are there safe ways to shut down, like, an operation? Like, in terms of the monkey wrenching, can you is there a safe way if they were pumping out? No, probably not. Probably not really safe, at least for you. In the like there's the no risk of it exploding or anything. Oh that. no, that's conceivable. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, no, things explode. <laughs> Especially um, compressor stations, mm -hmm. right, which are essentially controlled bombs. Um, no, they can explode. No, the 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 way to get at this is 
before they build it. Right? And it, that's, you know, terribly optimistic. But really the only way to get at this that's going to be very effective is to keep them from building the things at all. And so one of my just endless complaints in Pennsylvania, and I, there were, I'm always trying to get people to listen to me about this, is that we go, we'll do a lockdown. All right, so we'll go, right, we'll do a lockdown. And I'm usually there like as the photographer um, and, the, and the writer. Like I'm blogging it and shooting it and, and then and they're, you know, got their wrists in cement. <laughs> um, and, but if it ends at the end of that day, then you cost them some money, right? And it's always awesome to cost them money, right? And you do the cost of money is good. The next day they're going to come back out and they're just going to be super fortified with the state police who work for the companies for all practical purposes. And so what you have to actually do is lay siege, right? Like you have to have an army and like they do at, at Lake Seneca, right? Where they have people there almost all the time prepared to be arrested, right? Where they've laid siege, right? You can't leave. Right, because the minute you leave, man, those gates are open. And, and I think the most successful example, right, it still ultimately failed, but my most successful example of that was in the summer of 2012 at this mobile home park called Riverdale. I don't know how many of you have heard the, the siege at Riverdale, okay? So, um, I, so I was there the whole time. And um, we, this was a mobile home park, for folks who don't know, this was a, a mobile home park, about 32 families young families, working class families, retired veterans, right? Folks making a living. And um, a um, water company wanted to come in and um, take over all the land and because it's right on the Susquehanna River and convert it into a water withdrawal for fracking operations in Tyagot that I just showed you, right? Tyagot outside of Williamsport. So um, a number of groups actually came together at that point um, and a lot of college students, a lot of kids, um, and we laid siege. So of the people who moved out, we, um, with their permission, dismantled their mobile homes, and we used the roofing to make to make barricades. All right, so I have these awesome pictures of us like, dragging chunks of mobile homes, you know, and then we make bar and we paint the barricades, and we paint lots of wording on the barricades, like a postal worker lives here, All right? A truck driver lives here. Our school bus driver lives here, right? And then we um, policed the park 24 seven, right? So I have these really fond memories. My daughter, Carly, was in um, Korea at the time as a teacher, an English teacher. And um, she would be on her lunch break and I was doing like the 12 to midnight to 3 a.m. shift on the security, which is hysterically funny, right? This tiny woman has her coffee cup and a plastic chair. <laughs> Uh, you know, but keeping the trucks from any kind of truck from any the demolition crews, right? That wanted to come in. So I'd be talking to Carly on the phone. She'd be on her lunch break <laughs> in Korea, and then one day it stopped being funny um, because then one day these hired security guards came and they tried to scare us out, and we sat down and locked arms. Um, and then the states the states came, um, and um, then the only reason that we weren't there were about 50 of us arrested on Moss was because the people who lived in the mobile home park, we had always said we would do what they asked us, that it was their <coughs> park. <coughs> and they pleaded with us to stand down to prevent our arrest. So I'm not sure we should have done that. I have very mixed feelings about doing that. I kind of, I think we should have actually stayed. But, um, so we stood down um, and narrowly escaped. Um, and I was like on the phone with a Mother Jones reporter with all these kids in my car and we're filthy at this point. <laughs> um, you know, back to Bloomsburg, which is like an hour away. Right? But we held that park down for 13 days. 13 days. And, and we cost that company probably two or three million dollars. And then the demolition crews were there the next morning and I was there to see if the demolition crews actually showed up. And I got them stopped uh, for three more weeks because they were doing demolition where I knew there was asbestos and there were children in the park. <laughs> children living in the park. 
and they were demolishing these mobile pumps that I knew because they were 10 out of 10 old old mobile pumps. I knew there was asbestos, so I got them stopped for three more weeks. But then that was it; it was over. Yeah. Um, I agree that we shouldn't use property rights to fight. But I'm curious whether, um, like, if you look at, like, the tar sands fight and stuff, like, using indigenous land rights mm -hmm. is a different that's animal a, because I it's argue like that's a different animal. Rights. Okay. Yeah, I yeah I would argue that is an importantly different animal. Uh, indigenous land rights have are, are not really about property, mm -hmm. and but they, although they are about culture, right and. Um, and history. Right, so last October I was um, in Mexico helping uh, my friend David uh, do some organizing um, and he had brought some representatives of some of the indigenous peoples near Chihuahua um, and um, Veracruz uh, and, yep. <laughs> um, and we had a lot of discussion just like that about the difference between property and land. And these are folks who see themselves as defending their lives, their ways of life, not just the property. So no, I agree entirely. That's a different thing. Any other observations? Oh, sorry. you were great. I'm and sorry. You were great. Your presentation oh, was you. great. And don't worry at all about offending anyone in this we're like a zero hundred percent offended by anything so you're, <laughs> okay thank you we're you're that's, good that's not true in my my neighborhood in light street pennsylvania <laughs> <laughs> yeah with yeah with all the with all the, the truckster size any other observations yes sir um i raise sheep so some of your comments about animal agriculture, but I do it all grass fed, like okay. ninety percent grass fed. Okay. No fact, I agree. Factory farming is awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually one of the reasons I got into it. Yeah. But, um, so when you said you you seem to argue that okay, even the grass fed line argument is no good because you can't yeah. feed a world it, that it's people that way. But what if the point isn't feeding the world? It's because one of the if you read certain people like Alan Savory and there's a soil scientist on forgetting your name right now, mm -hmm. at Cornell, who, had, who shows that proper rotational grazing actually sequesters carbon in the soil. Sure. And so that could be the point. And, and that, sure, and that's, it, there's a saving grace there that I'm more than ready to acknowledge. I still think that such operations ultimately contribute to the reproduction of a, of a, of a class system, however, I would argue because the um, products of those systems are still only available or accessible to a very small number of people who can afford it. Well, but if one of the products mm -hmm. is the carbon being sequestered, that's forever. It, yes, and I acknowledge that as well, and yet that's an argument that's probably not going to be persuasive to folks who are at the bottom of the food chain in the global class system. Um, so I see that point. Um, I would still also argue, and I, I think that this is a harder argument to make out because it's not as much about suffering, that if we take it to be the case that um, a, a creature's life, even if the way that you slaughter, say, is, is painless, that there's something morally problematic about the denial of something's life once it does exist. Right? Once it does exist, right? We, we wouldn't have, say in the case of factory farms, right? We wouldn't have, so my, my mom says this to me, she says, well, what would happen to all the cows? Well, there just wouldn't be either. <laughs> right, we just stop making the cows, right? And so, you know, if, if we say, if we agree that the, that something's life has value that oughtn't to be ended uh, it, just for my consumption, when I don't need it, then um, it, there's still something problematic, no matter what the farming strategy is. Right? But I, 
I'm not nearly at, I don't get nearly as upset about the free range grass fed, at least their living lives up until some point in the, the factory farms, of course, and, not. And, it, and this isn't just about factory farms either, of course, it's about animal experimentation, medical ex industrial experimentation, right? There's a whole fur wearing, right, leather production, you know, there's a whole wide range of things there. It's not just important. Sir? Um, I disagree with you on some of your statements about capitalism. Okay. Let's um, have at it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm good on this. Um, I, f uh, uh, I feel that uh, uh, you make two assumptions about capitalism. Capitalism is merely a means of organizing the means of production. It does not necessitate, it does not necessitate um, there being uh, infinite resources and endless growth. I believe this that is our an modern. Of I believe our modern corporate imperialism does. Corporate yeah. imperialism does, but capitalism has been around for a very long time, and for the most part, and this is true with most of the small businesses you could walk into. Mm -hmm. They're not looking to grow. They're just looking not to shrink. They I want to have I that amounts to the same thing. I don't believe it does because you're not looking for infinite resources at that point. I. Well, if you want to, if you want to survive at least until the end of your days in that business, you still have to make some assumption that your resources aren't going to run out, right? And some of those resources, invariably, I inevitably, are going to be carbon, right? So, but to the first point, right? The, the one common objection to the kind of argument I'm making now, um, and this is an, a good objection that comes from this um, really interesting economist. His name's Herman Daly, is that we ought to make a distinction between, say, global corporatists, right, the big gun capitalism, right, and, and, and well, small global C. Global corporate imperialism. Sure, cor fine, yeah, ha what, whatever it is that we, we call it. Um, corp corporatized fascism, even. <laughs> um, sure, it's a better phrase. But I, but I would argue that there's no crisp line to be drawn, ultimately, between those two things. And it is more often the case than not that the small business does desire to grow to be the lar the really large business, right? Nike is kind of the quintessential example, right? Starts in his basement, right? He's just, you know, ironing rubber onto the bottom of shoes. You get a great runner like Prefontaine, you know, and then pretty soon, you know, we've got sweatshops in Vietnam, right? And, but that's a, the dream, at least according to um, critical theorists on this point, of maybe not all, but most capitalists. Yeah, because that growth is also survival in virtue of the fact that they have to compete with other similar businesses. Even in Marxism, they draw a distinction between the petty bourgeois who yeah. owns the shop yeah. and, the, uh, and, the, and the gross capitalist. Yeah, the factory owner. Right. And I think that the vast majority of capitalist enterprises are the petty bourgeois sort, mm -hmm. sort which are not necessarily looking to expand to something larger than what they are. But some of them, I would argue in return, eventually will. And so even if it's the case that many will remain relatively small, though there will inevitably be some that are going to become Chevron or Walmart or Ikea or whatever. And then we ultimately still end up in the same place that we are now because it doesn't take that many, right? There's only, what, about 250 really <coughs> large corporations on mm -hmm. the planet. It doesn't really take all that many um, to um, see our way through to the very sorts of crisis that we are now facing with respect to climate change. Right? And once they reach that kind of hegemony, right, they're so immensely powerful, right? Exxon has its own standing army that there's no, there's no going back from that, right? There's only stopping it from the beginning and there's no way to tell who's going to just stay small and who's going to get big. So that's my worry about it. There's a slippery slope and I'll agree with you, but I don't think we throw it out because there is a slippery slope. I think it's hard to throw it out because, of course, the natural question is what would be the replacement? Mm -hmm. But I'd also argue that if we don't start looking for that, that we're really in trouble. Because it, whatever the case is about capitalism, where we are now, it is one of, it is the driver. But even in, you know, I talk a lot about co-ops. Yeah. 
and most of the co-ops work upon a capitalist idea that they are trying to Quasi. organize labor based upon yeah. based upon work-based payments. Sure. And so they're working in a similar sort of environment. Yeah, and some of them become wagemans. And and I understand that. And uh, but uh, uh, the uh, you're going to need some form of organization and some stick to get the people to sure or that, but carrot that to get people to do the work. Sure, but that doesn't necessarily mean the reduction of all value. To and and I agree, but I don't think the capitalism leads inevitably to that. I think we've allowed it to lead to that. Does it make a difference? Well. I believe one of them makes capitalists to blame and the other makes us to blame for the situation. Fair enough. And I think it is very important that we look inside and say, yeah, we were to blame for getting here. Oh, certainly. And some far more than others. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, discussion of right to housing and private property. Okay. I'm not quite sure. Well, you know, it's, uh, uh, if you assume there should be a right to house, it should be no issue, but that's a big issue. Oh, okay. And, I kind of see And uh, property rights. So yeah. I don't want to say too much, so I want you to <laughs> answer them in terms of how do you, how do you have, how do you deal with both those things? So yeah. It could be a conflict. Yeah. I, it it seems to be... The, yeah, they, yeah, they could be, especially if you own a lot of property and you have, you know, a gigantic house, something like that. I think I would want to argue here that it is not. I don't want to. I'm going to be an unreconstructed Marxist on this point. Marx himself, and I think a lot of post-Marxists that came after, weren't arguing against all private ownership, right? They weren't arguing. I think Marx is often misread on this point that all, all things or all property ought to be collectivist. So that I, for example, I own, a, I own a, an old farmhouse and a quarter of an acre, um, you know, out in rural Pennsylvania. And what I think about that is that there are some things I should be able to do with that that I, might, I should be able to call mine. But where the conflict is with what's going to be, say, the damage to my neighbor, then I should refuse to be pooled in the in the um, the gas contract, whether my neighbor agrees to or not, because the value of my land is not reducible to property, and the value of my even my house and my stuff isn't reducible merely to property. If my doing with that property means that my neighbor is harmed, and so I can have my house. But I think that my neighbor should also get to have her house. And I think that if we, you know, in, a, in an ideal world where, you know, we were all decent human beings, that we would see much more collective agreement about not selling out just because we want a royalty check. And this is where fracking in Pennsylvania has been monumentally divisive in communities like Dimmick, right, in Susquehanna County. Right? Some people sign on, you know, they sign a lease, they're looking forward to the royalties, right? They're sort of getting screwed on that now because they can't price the gas so well. Um, you know, but, but it's their neighbor. They you know the pipeline's going under, right? Or, you know, that the lights are right, you know, right in the neighbor's, you know, driveway. You know, it's their neighbor that really gets harmed. And you know the irony of some of that is that you know townships have laws, have you know all kinds of ordinances about you know like where I can um, put my fence, you know. So yeah, yeah, got setbacks, right? Got you know got um, lee ways. <laughs> we have all you know, and those are all about protecting the rights of your neighbors. And, and yet, when it comes to this industry, in some ways, unlike any other I've ever seen, it's like all bets are off. All bets are off. The other thing is, is, you know, in urban areas, a lot of areas, too, that the whole three year town has got more and more tax development, redevelopment, yeah. urban development, blah, blah, blah. And for a long time, up to a number of people, um, especially people in the residence, and especially in the court, who 
were told what to do, I mean, they have too many to say, and not all, and then the, the system decided, you know, we're going to develop this way, or we're going to improve the welfare, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's stacking a little bit is that people have to fight about this, and some people fight together because the neighborhood says, we um, want to have more say over what mm -hmm. happens mm -hmm. to that building. And now, we get people together, we yeah. can go either way. Right. But I'm just, one no of I'm thinking of is just because I think, how do you implement these things? I mean, we're talking about, uh, you said about housing and the mm -hmm. Well, those conversations, they go on. Yeah, and, yeah. But they don't go on in routine right. ways because we don't have grassroots structures. Yes. That so that, that, and that's also a great point of time for <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, and the easy answer to that to that question, how do you get people together, is education, right? But I say that with this immense cynicism at this point, because we seem to be living in a political climate where education just doesn't gain any traction. You know, I, I, why my neighbors are voting for I just can't. I can, it's just lost on me because it's so it's not just an intellectual it's not that I'm just a snotty philosopher it's that the, the guy, people are voting directly against their own best interests because they're not the dialogue and and that's what I, I mean I'm not trying to make this sound easy but it, it is not so you have the education piece but that takes time to actually get yeah there. yeah and so in the meantime you know and it just may sound yeah I don't want to try to sound too here, but uh, if you sometimes we have diversity in areas, you, there's some tension around that. But sure. then also, if it's economic, a little bit of economic diversity, mm -hmm. <laughs> you also can have a, a chance sometimes. Uh, especially if people decide, I don't want to be uh, the victim of some redevelopment thing, and they mm -hmm. get tired and sick of that. Yeah. So you might have an audience. And it requires a lot of talking, but you might have an audience in which these conversations about what you want your career to look like, what you want to mm -hmm. can come in. Mm -hmm. But you have to have people, two people, and have people who can bring that knowledge in. But mm -hmm. most people, we don't give people. And, and they're willing to. Yeah, we don't give grassroots education to people who live on you know, the street to that street. We just kind of mm -hmm. play games with them. And that, yeah. mm -hmm. So let me. Could happen. I mean, there could be a massive education of people in in the in cities. It should have been done over the years. You can't do it mm -hmm. But that is one way. I would see a little bit when you have that kind of the right mix. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but not everybody's going to be in agreement. Well, either, it, I, it's know. it's not different with something like fracking. I have. I don't. I can't even tell you how many times very goodwill, educated folks try things just like this, like just like this, just like what we're doing right there, with very little turnout, right, or only turnout right from, you know, from the choir. Mm -hmm. And the, the people that you need to come, you know, to the hearing, the township meeting, the municipality board, you know, the what, don't, don't show up. And in Pennsylvania, I think part of the reason for this, and there may be some truth to this here too, that it's a kind of culture of resignation. This is a state that's, you know, been hammered by anthracite coal mining. This is a state that's been, you know, hammered by logging, you know, and timbering. And um, so you have this this kind of cultural disposition to resign. You know, you just, you, this is just something that you can't fight. And our laws encourage and reinforce that because of the second class status of municipalities. And at least you guys can't fuck wrong, right? Which is an awesome thing, yeah. yeah. I am the youth, <laughs> So, alrighty, are we all warm enough? Yeah, I know. I'm, I thank you so much for staying and even coming out. I know, I know it's a warm night, and there's you know music and beer like right over there. <laughs> so, any other questions I can answer? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, <laughs> thank you everyone, for showing up tonight. Um, we will continue to have events.